Look, I don't know them personally, but has Sergio Concesao considered maybe his family's just really annoying? This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name's Elliot Smith, the Gabak Man, Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Yeah, look, he's accused so many managers of saying things about his family. I mean, maybe it's because they they just suck. I don't know. You, your mileage may vary, but you know what, Sergio Concesao? No one has to think about you anymore because you're not relevant anymore because your team went out and our team went through. Arsenal Football Club into the quarterfinals of the Champions League for the first time in 14 years. Long overdue and extremely joyous occasion. A historic night at Emirates Stadium. A nervy night, a long night. I think everybody got their money's worth. You have to pay extra for those Champions League tickets. Well, (laughs) by minutes, you got your money's worth. I don't know by football if you got your money's worth. Um, It wasn't a tie that anyone's going to want to rewatch. You know, people usually after a big win, first thing they're asking us, when's the rewatch go up? Haven't heard many shouts for that, but um, the emotion is something I'd rewatch. If you do want to tap into the raw emotion, uh, our instant reaction was really, really celebratory and joyous. Uh, Clive from the ground, Phil Costa, Paul, myself, there's a video of it as well. So if you want to tap into that, that raw emotion right at full time is out there for you over um, on the Patreon side of things. And we'll be doing stuff all week about the, 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 the game, the tie and the draw and all that stuff. We'll have an episode on Patreon for the draw on Friday. Normally this would come out Thursday, but how can we wait? It's such a historic night for the club. We had to do something now. I am so glad to be doing this. I am so glad to be discussing Arsenal advancing in the Champions League and now all eyes on Manchester City 432 days from now. Um, but we go into it at least in a positive spirit. And here in a positive spirit with me is a man who got home maybe five minutes ago. His name is Clive. You can find him on Twitter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Yeah, man. Good I can't talk find to the you. energy somehow, but <laughs> <laughs> mate, it was, uh, it was, it felt, I feel like I played. That's how I feel like today. I feel got mm. bruises all over me. I feel battered. But yeah, fantastic night. Fantastic. Really, really special occasion. Really special night. And, you know, the kind that nobody nobody thinks about how you got there when you get there in a cup competition. That's the beauty of it. And so when we're playing PSG or Bayern or Barca or Madrid, just not Manchester City, please, in the next round, no one's going to be thinking about how we got there. They're going to be thinking about the challenge of trying to beat a very, very good Arsenal team that showed massive character. And Normally, we go step by step through the game and the tactics and the performances, but I do think it's worth starting at the end and then rowing back a little bit because so much of what matters about the night comes at the end and comes in the ultimate conclusion of the game. So I just felt so connected to everybody in the wake of this. It was the kind of joy and sense of joy that you you don't get anywhere else. You know, I really thought about it and I thought, what else gives you this? What else in your life can deliver this? Very, very little. You know, football can take you down to to a, a dark place, which is unfortunate, but it can lift you to these kind of places, this kind of euphoria in a way that very, very little does. And so, Clive, let's just talk about that for a moment. David Raya saves the final penalty. It dawns on everyone. We've done it. We've gone through. We're into the quarterfinals for the first time in 14 years. Maybe you can contextualize the emotion on the ground on the night and in that moment, and then we can expand a little bit on what it means for the club. Yeah, the whole day was um, interesting, shall we say. We did a podcast, didn't we, in the first part of the day. And Mm -hmm. I couldn't help but say what my truth is. And we saw the away leg and we saw a Porter team that was, for me, pretty good. And people saying me, don't worry about it, Clive, it's going to be 5 0. And I just couldn't see it. You know, I just couldn't see it. And this wasn't like my normal anxiety nerves pre game. This was like, well, this is what I've seen. And I think this is a challenge for us, you know, the way they play, etc. And as the game got closer, I think that maybe my emotions were being multiplied elsewhere. I, 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 saw, I felt the confidence sort of dissipate a little bit with people that I spoke to, spoke to James, Tim before the game. And people were saying, this is going to be difficult, you know. And then um, you go into the ground and we, we put on our job hats on. We've got a job to do. So from that point of view, let's do our job and... They got us into our seats really early, and it was electric, mate. Honestly, electric. And um, couldn't have been better. The singing was top. Everything was perfect. The, the events now, these games, are just wonderful to watch. The, you know, the the fire, the singing, the flags, everything is just, like, unbelievable. Unbelievable. And then and then you, you end up with a game like that where, I have to be honest with you, I'm going to say it, I love how I feel today. But if you ask me, did I enjoy it? Well, I enjoyed the outcome. 
Did I enjoy it, mate? Head in hand stuff. Honestly, head in hand Nobody stuff. Nobody enjoyed that. No, oh, yeah. I'm so glad you said that. Head in hand stuff. I was stooped over my seat, literally head in hands, just looking forward, going, oh, my God, please. And I started to ask myself, why did I feel like that? And I think as a set of Arsenal people, we all feel connected to the club and we all think there's something in this team. We like them. We know what we're looking at. We think we're quite good. But if this goes wrong, we're going to have to question ourselves. And I didn't want that. None of us wanted that. And um, and so the outcome was m- almost more important than the aesthetics of the performance for me earlier. And um, but yeah, today I'm exhausted. And and I listened to you guys last night. And you lifted me, man. You were funny. You lifted me. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was flying. <laughs> I, I was ex- I, I was exhausted. And I needed lifting. And um, it was just an incredibly important moment for the football club, and I'm not. I don't. I think I'm not overstating that. I think it's so important for this group of people, executives, coaches, players. That's the most important night we've had for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't disagree, and I, you know, I think there is a sense sometimes that if Arsenal don't brush someone aside, that the shortcomings are all Arsenal's. Instead of realizing that other teams can do things <clears throat> to make it difficult for you to create a challenge, they get to do tactics too. They have some players that are actually quite good, as it turns out. Um, and oh, by the way, the club we are facing, they've got a better pedigree in this competition than we do. I'm not proud of that, but they do. This is a step towards reversing that, hopefully, on a path towards building a better pedigree in this competition, a better legacy in this competition. But Porto's won it a couple of times. We've not. And I realize the players on the pitch last night didn't win it when Jose Mourinho did. I get it. But there is, I think, an ability to be overawed by a moment. And there were certainly players out there that looked like they were. But the goal isn't to finesse your way past, to style your way past. It's just to get past. And I I do think that we should celebrate, by the way, the fact that we are a team now that doesn't wear the clown shoes so much. And what I mean by that is, sure, we didn't create as much as we'd like and we didn't break them open as much as we'd like. But the solidity we have, to concede just 0.5 expected goals in European competition, to concede one goal over 120 minutes. That's why we were in a position to go to penalties and to win it. Because we didn't, you know, put on the clown shoes last night and do something really idiotic. We we showed the composure to the extent that it was needed to get through. In terms of what it means for the club, I just think it's massive. I think it's massive for going to face City, you know, where we are a club sitting at the same table as them. You know, if someone put up a graphic that was on the screen last night of the clubs that are qualified. I know there's some games today as we sit and record, but it's Bayern, Madrid, Barca, PSG, Manchester City, Arsenal. That Those are the names we're, we're now listed next to. And there's there's a lot of respect that goes with that. And I, I don't want to go too big, but when you're recruiting in the summer, when you're lining up to play a big game and you feel that you belong at that table and players think you belong at that table, that's important. Our Champions League history is sepia-toned at this point. For players looking at joining the club, now it's coming back into vivid color. And that's going to mean a lot for us moving forward. But I want to, I want to talk about the penalty shootout because, Clive... There's so much to a penalty shootout. It, it's a unique thing to this sport, and it's a unique thing when it happens in this competition. I think there's just a tremendous sense of poetry to the fact that a year ago, almost to this day, a few days away, a year ago, we go out to Portuguese opposition in the Europa League on a shootout. And a year later, the step we've taken is we we overcome Portuguese opposition in a shootout in the Champions League. What are your thoughts on the penalty shootout? Because whatever failures there were during the game and whatever mentality concerns we had during the game, they were shunted aside in the penalty shootout. Everyone held their nerve beautifully. Yeah. And the whole penalty shootout thing is an insight into our manager. I mean, people, I, I, people have a perception of him that he's a bit chippy and he likes to move around the technical area and he can over celebrate. They're looking at the wrong things. We get beat by we get beat by Sporting. Was it last year on penalties? Mm-hmm. What do we do coming to preseason? What do we see at the end of preseason games? Penalty shootouts. We're all thinking, what are we doing that for? You know, and um, and then we win the penalty shootout in Community Shield. This guy is about details. It's about making us better, right? And so I'd seen all these penalty takers apart from Declan Rice before, 
I think I think they took penalties against Sevilla in the Emirates Cup. Right, so they, they've to, also all taken penalties in the Premier League this season, which yeah. I wouldn't just dismiss. You know, yeah, Kai has, point. Odegaard has, Saka has. You know? Yeah, and um, and it's it's just these details really matter, and so I just it's like an insight into your manager. This guy is not messing about. He is trying to be the very best. The people who have a look at his frailties. Have a look at what he's doing. Have a look at our points total increasing year on year. We watched the City Liverpool game the weekend. We were finishing 15, 20, 30 points behind them about three years ago. Look at where we are now. This guy is not messing. He is going for it, mate. He's going for it. And he's ruthless and he's going for it. He's prepared and he's making sure people around him have the same mindset. It's brilliant. And, um, yeah, the whole, the, the players just rose to that occasion in it because they looked tired, man. They looked tired. You know, mm. there were people, what you don't see on TV is when there are breaks in play, you can, you can look around the pitch and you can see people doing their stretches, look, holding onto their calves and bent over. And I'm yeah. thinking, man, this is, I know Brentford was taxing. It was far too taxing a game for, for, for a European game. And you could see Brentford in some of their legs. And, but you knew they had to dig deep because we had a big break afterwards. So, and they did that, mate. So, the penalty shootout was was joyous. We took we're going to goalkeeper obviously in a little while, but our technique and the way we approached it and, and the way the fans engaged in it was just perfection, perfection. Yeah. By the way, in the wake of big moments like this, you always wind up with some fantastic media out there that you can look at. There's so much great fan media. There's there's Saliba just. The celebration he gave, the release, the kissing of the badge, the pointing to the badge, the celebrating with the fans. There's a great video of that from the, from the from a fan. I'm, I apologize. I don't know whose it was. There's another great video of a fan uh, shot by a fan of Martin Odegaard just collapsing to the ground yeah, and taking absolutely. a moment overwhelmed by emotion. All the players going up to him and just seeing what it means to him. I, I welled up watching it. There's some fun stuff. The CVS Galazzo crew, the people that cover it for the U.S. Um, first of all, there's Thierry Henry. When Galeno put the penalty down, he said he misses. He misses. I see it how he put the pen, how he put the ball down. He misses, right? And he just walks away. He walks out of the studio and and he misses. And there there's Carragher and Michael Richards going. He knows ball. He knows ball. I thought yeah, that was yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah. And and one of the great things is they had Bukayo Saka over and Saka sang his own song uh, yeah, on TV, yeah. it, which was fun. And and Saka was just yeah, it was great to listen to. So a lot of good moments like that. I think. You know, I want to read a couple of Mikel quotes. First of all, talk about self-reflection in a big moment on, on his learnings from the two legs in the Champions League. He says, having experience, I haven't done it before. It's the first time I've done anything in the Champions League. You know, I think that's important to remember. We forget how young this guy is, not just as a, as a coach, but just as a human being, he's young. He's a young, young man in, in terms of this career. And then on the penalties... You know, he says whether he was comfortable. He says no, because practicing in the training ground, a few of them missed, by the way, yesterday. Not today, but this is the key part. He says, we prepare everything. The extra time, the scenarios, the changes, how the players have to drink and eat and all that. And in the end, you have to do it in the game. And to replicate the scenarios is really difficult. Total credit to the boys stepping up with maturity with the confidence they delivered. And I even noticed something. Clive, it's these little details in a penalty shootout. They, they took a camera angle from behind the two teams at the halfway line, right? And the Porto team is just all over the place. They're antsy. They're moving around. They're kind of pacing. They're, they're shifting from one foot to the next. The Arsenal team, arms around each other. One line, unified, solidarity, arms around each other, focused. Um, how important do you think it was, by the way, that the coin toss went for us, that we got to shoot first and into the North Bank instead of into the Porto fans? It made a difference to my day because everyone cheered, right? Because I'm in the North Bank end and in the corner there. And so I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to see something here. And that's the end was totally populated by Arsenal people. So I was pleased about that. And the fact that we went first was also the right way to do it. The Odegaard steps up and you're thinking that's the best guy to go first. You know, <clears throat> he's got the best technique. And... They just go for their routines and, oh, mate, it's so difficult. How do they manage to focus on all the perfection of stride pattern, ball contact, looking at the keeper, have, having their – I know it's their job and I know they practice, but I don't care. I'm not sure if you can practice for that. You know, this is 
massive, and they and they they rose to it earlier. And when you watch it on TV, their goalkeeper, I watched him. Well, we watched him in the first leg. I thought he was quite sharp. I thought he was quite good. I was a bit concerned about him, but mate, we froze him to the ground. We froze him to the ground. He 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 couldn't read us at all. And um, and our goalkeeper was completely different. He 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 conveyed something else that I think got into their heads. Yeah, I want I want to spend some time on him right now. Actually, um, Wendell, who was brilliant in this tie, let's be honest. I think he gave Saka some of the hardest time he's had all season in a couple of seasons. The hardest, but he put that I've ball. Saka have the hardest, without a doubt. Yeah, get Nathan Ake, credit to him. Get anybody else. This is mm-hmm. the guy that's made him think the most. Yeah, and credit to him, but he put that ball down and struck it so quick, like he didn't want to be taking a penalty. And Raya saves it beautifully onto the post and then around. Um, he saved from Galeno. He almost saved another one um, that he just gets his fingers to. It's uh, the Gerlich one, Grealich, whatever. Mm. Um, this, it's interesting because we just had at the weekend maybe the handoff from Ramsdale to Riot in the sense that we kind of saw Ramsdale get away with it, but we were reminded, you know, of 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 a guy who maybe we're we're right to be moving on from. And then just a few days later, we get this from Ramsdale uh, from Raya. This this is the Raya night for me. I mean, it's it's not just him. The whole team did it. And we'll talk about some players that really stepped up in addition to him. But I feel great for this guy. And Mikel referenced it too. You know, that he was someone who came into the club and got a little bit of a hard time. He That's not easy. To come to a place where the guy you're replacing is so popular. To then make some mistakes that have people questioning it. The narrative around it, and, and we weren't exempted from this at times, is why have you introduced this emotional trauma into the group and the fan base. Why have you introduced this challenge for Raya to overcome it, to make the job his, for Mikel to create an environment where he could feel that comfortable, and then to have this moment. Kudos to him, man. He's a hero of Arsenal getting somewhere they haven't been in 14 years, and his name goes down as as an important name in the club now as a result of this. I think it will only uh, improve him moving forward, and I, I couldn't be happier for him. Yeah, I mean, I've gone on a journey with, with Raya. I think i watched all the games and <clears throat> footballistically why I said it, we can see why he plays. We're not stupid. We can we can see where he plays. We can see that he steps into our back line. We can see what he does to us. He's ball striking and it's really, really good. He made some errors early on with some crosses. And I do think the way he was introduced to us was a bit clumsy word-wise. From Arteta talk about, he left some words out there that people could leap on about substituting a keeper. He was never going to substitute a keeper. But the potential to play two keepers was there. And I I, I misread some of his comments. I think, you know what, Ramsdale will have a few games and Ray will have the majority of games and we'll have two active keepers. So when Ramsdale wasn't playing, I was a bit disappointed. I thought, we just got one active keeper. And that's not that's not healthy. You know, that that was my feeling. But footballistically, otherwise, mate, profile-wise, he, he's excellent. And since Dubai, I've said it on here, I think he stopped apologising for being Arsenal's goalkeeper. He stopped apologising to all the people who want to see Ramsdale playing. He says, I'm going to play properly now. And since then, I think he's been so much more outgoing, so much more. It's not false cheering with the fans. It's real. And now he's driving his own connection. And his ability, the Ramsdale game against Brentford, <clears throat> in some ways, sometimes you get better when you don't play. And, um, and and he got better that day. And then, Elliot, it wasn't just the penalty saves. His, they were putting him under pressure. His clearances had to go long, but they were done with quality. They were done with comfort. He can manipulate the ball with his studs on the floor. He, he, the way he works to receive it, much much better foot movement before the ball comes to him. So he's forcing an easier first touch so he can strike out of the zone rather than standing still and having to make a big touch we, that could entice a player on. The guy's a footballer. This sort of stuff you teach fullbacks. Seriously, mm. how to separate and create room, create a good body angle for the next pass. The guy's a footballer, and there were some crosses late in the in the game that they were getting, and we had Zinchenko on the pitch. I think he messed up one in the corner, and they got a corner. So it's similar to Fulham. So I'm I'm in that negative spiral mode, thinking they're going to score from this corner. Ray just comes out, mate, and just takes it out of the air, and it just kills them stone dead. And they they trudge back, and then he comes to the penalties. And when you're a little bit smaller, you tend to have good bounding ability. So that spring and bound, and he's got that. He has got it in space. That allows him to take crosses, 
And that allows him to really bound off his line in any direction he wants to go. And, mate, he's a weapon. How many tournaments have you seen in your life, European tournaments, world tournaments, being ended by penalty shootouts? Hmm, Maybe enough. we've underestimated the value of having a top, top keeper. And we have got one. You know what else it does? Look, let's be honest. When you replace a popular guy, Ramsdale wasn't just popular with the fans. I think he was popular with the team as well. With the whole club. When you make that change, the players look at the manager and say, what's the boss up to here? Why is he doing mm. this? Those players are going to look at this now and say, this boss is sharp, huh? This manager knows. If he's trying to replace me, I need to up my level. If you know, I better look at my game because he took this guy that we all loved and the fans all loved, and he said, I can upgrade on that guy, and he has. I, I got. I got to think about that. Like, I think it sends a really great message. Yeah. I mean, I, and, you know, and let's be clear on the emotional side. Yeah, it, it's it's painful for Ramsdale. And it's painful for us who care about him. This isn't about Ramsdale though. It's about Raya. But I think it it transmits a a, a message about the standards right to the team, and that the manager has his eye always on what's best for the overall. But I don't think we should go another minute without focusing on one other player. It, it is a group moment. And I will say this about it being a group moment. I'm not sure I've seen Saka have a night like this. It wasn't his best. And I mm -hmm. think over the two legs, it's probably, since he's come to the club, it's the least assured I think I've seen William Saliba look since he's come to the club over these two legs. Um, And and th there's credit to Raya there too, right? Because normally he's got these rocks and Gabriel and Saliba in front of him. But it wasn't really the case and he he had to do a little extra to help them out and he did. Um. But you know what? Not Saka's best game necessarily. I don't think it was Declan Rice's best game by a long shot, at least when he was playing in the eight. When he dropped back to the six, I think he looked more like himself, but he had very mm -hmm. few touches, was was not very included. The reason I bring this up is Saka, bad night, steps up, slots his penalty brilliantly. Rice, not his best night, steps up, slots his penalty. Kai Havertz struggled a little bit to get involved, to find his rhythm, steps up, slots it, right? And we think of Havertz, oh, he's not clinical. He looked pretty darn clinical from the spot, didn't he? So... You know, we start to write this narrative, Arsenal were nervous, the moment was too big for them, could they handle it? But when the moment was its biggest and the pressure was its maximum, these players showed they had the character to do it. So, you know, I, I think I think that really, really means something and it will, it will help them because the season's only going to get more pressurized. And yeah. to have come through something like this, you know, I, I said, I've said this before, but pressure can grind people to dust or forge them into diamonds. And I think it, you know, it turned us into diamonds last night, Clive. That's going to be valuable as the season wears on. Yeah, well, you mentioned a few players there, and um, there were some seven out of ten nights, right? And we we needed eight and nines for this game to feel happy. But I think you've been the generous. Cons There's some score inflation there, great inflation. Yeah. <laughs> They're not seven well, out of ten, but, you, but that's but fine. You know what I mean? Uh, it's, yeah, it, it's. But you know what? Within that context of that six, seven out of ten, then I'll give you a six. Um, <laughs> so basically, are they still working? Are they still tracking? Are they still showing for the ball? Are they still holding our shape? They're doing all them things. They were a little bit blunted on occasions by good opponents, but they didn't disappear. They didn't throw away. The body language was spot on. They didn't throw away any of the principles. So, and there was one or two that just gave us the nines, right? So, and I agree with you on um, on Saka, but you, if you look at him so far score today, he's up there as one of our top scorers because he has shots, he has crosses, he still affects the game. The fact he falls over on a couple of those shots, and we know he's not in top physical shape because he was quite tired late on. We know that because we know him, but he's still got in dribbles, carries, and statistically looks quite good. Right. So on Declan Rice, I felt he was absent a little bit earlier, and. We're going to have no doubts that we're going to have a 6 8 debate over the next couple of weeks. But in on this day, I didn't feel we could have our 100 million pound player standing there watching other people have the touches on the ball. I didn't, I didn't want that, you know, and um, mm. because it's too important. That was my gut feeling. And I felt he was, he was, he got himself into a position that was a little bit no man's landy. And I wanted him to have more touches. I wanted him to see the game, not not be facing the game like a forward, but to see the game and then travel with it and then drive the boat and switch the point of the attack, which he did when he went into the six. And we have to maybe have to bring a different eight, six, if you see what I mean, that, that way around rather than six, eight, which I think that's what Rice is. We need an eight, six that can maybe pass first player that can carry. Mm -hmm. I think that profile's missing in the team. 
But hey, look, we're we're talking small beans here because Georgina was great for fifty minutes. It, it's just what what happens when you're at six and a half out of ten is important. We we lost the Fulham when we were six and a half out of ten. We couldn't find it, but we found yeah. it in this game. All right, and I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, and sometimes you find it by the goals you score, but sometimes one of the ways you find it is, especially in cup football, tournament football, is not conceding, right? Mm. It's not giving anything away, so you stay in it. You know, It would have been a much easier night, to be fair, if we hadn't done the one stupid thing we did in 120 minutes at the very, 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 very death in the first leg, which unfortunately we had a really lovely view of, but it's all mm. water under the bridge right now. Look, everyone can have their favorites in a team. This team is full of favorites. Take your pick. But for me, the player who stands out last night is the man wearing the armband, the man who represents the arsenal. I think Mikel Arteta needs a coach on the pitch. He needs someone who reflects his ethos. And Martin Odegaard reflects his ethos. All commitment, all preparation, all quality, all the time. Because Martin Odegaard isn't just doing Cruyff turns and no-look passes, and reverse passes to create the only goal of the night that's the reason we went through, and kudos to Troussard, by the way. You create one clear chance. You've got to score it on a night like this, and he does. But Martin Odegaard is also running back and running forward, pressing the keeper in the 90th minute, the 105th minute. Martin Odegaard is recovering back when, you know, White has pushed up and he's struggling to recover, and Odegaard's back there. And he's stepping up to take the first penalty when it's the one that's going to set the tone for the penalty shootout. He is one of those guys that has the ability to have character in the way he speaks and acts, have character in the way he runs and contributes. But the critical thing you have to have to be allied to that, quality, absolute quality. So I think... The most character we saw on the night came from our captain, Martin Odegaard. I think the hardest work, the most running we saw on the night came from our captain, Martin Odegaard. But when the game was there to be taken, the most quality on the night was shown by our captain, Martin Odegaard. And Clive, we this is a guy who went to Real Madrid at a very, very, very young age. His quality was never in doubt. It just didn't happen for him there. What he has turned into as a man and as a player it represents the Arsenal in such a wonderful way. I don't think you could ask for a better captain for this manager than Martin Odegaard. Yeah, I think Elliot, I think, yeah, he he is the uh, identity of the club maybe that we we want to be now uh, and, mm. and how, we, how we operate and how we go about our business. Um, he did a lot of things that were visible, particularly off the ball, you know, and... I think he set, he kept us honest. He kept our tone high. He kept our levels high. So when we lost a little bit of belief because they had they had fifteen passes, he's the first one to pull it out of a gun out of the group. So I always look at the group. If you look at the team, it's almost like a a swarm of bees in a compact shape, and then someone jumps out and then goes to get them. So he's the first one to press them off the ball. They're kicking it out of a throw. They turn to the crowd. So he's orchestrating the team, our effort. But he's orchestrating the crowd as well. So he's setting the tone for the whole night. And some of that, he, I just checked Sofa's score just now. He didn't have the most touches. You know, he mm. didn't have the most touches. But in all those intangible things, he dominated the game. Completely dominated the game. And on the chance, I mean, on the goal for Trossard, I mean, I'm going to create a new nickname for him. I'm going to call him <laughs> Medusa. Because he turned four people to stone and sit the ball through them. And Pepe saw it coming, <laughs> and he saw it coming, so he dropped deep, which made Trossard stay on side. Pepe thought, I better go hero ball, try to block it, and he couldn't block it, and goal. And like, how do you do that at that moment? He just did it. He just did it and just killed people stone dead. I thought, sometimes in adversity, it's almost like you're looking at people to see who steps up when you know this is on the edge. Who steps up? who does more than they've ever done and dug into places and doing things like making tackles and being part of 11 jewels. That's a that's not a normal Martin Odegaard game, you know, when we're on top. But he put himself into those areas to do those things because this team and this club needed that on this night. And recognition mm. of what you need to do is why he's got the armband. You don't care about yourself. You care about everybody else. 
And that's how yeah. he played. I thought he was, I thought he was brilliant. It's a great shout. Yeah. And you look at the calendar year of 2024 and what we've achieved so far. I, I don't think it's any surprise that we've done that at a time when Odegaard is at his absolute best, the peak of his powers. He's been brilliant. Um, looks fit, looks ready, can run, has the quality. He's just been sensational. And I we think... Can, I just want to say, yeah, look, quickly, we both had the honor of meeting him, haven't we? We both mm, had the honor yeah. of meeting him at, at different events and how he represents the club and how he puts himself out for the club when he could easily sit at yeah. home. You know what I'm talking about, mate. You couldn't yeah. ask for a better representative. You just couldn't. No, totally agree. If you want more on Martin Odegaard, we went deep on him on the instant reaction as well. I think this gives us an opportunity to shift gears, to draw a line under the big moments, the emotion, the occasion, what it means to the club, Riot and Odegaard, the things that I think are top line important, and then go back a bit and talk about the tactical battle of the game and some of the things in the game because we still need to analyze the game. And then we're going to look at the draw. So let's do that. I think it is okay to hate the way Porto approached these two legs, to despise some of their time-wasting tactics, to be disgusted by what I think is classless behavior by Sergio Conceição. All of that's okay. And still be able to tip your hat to them for what I thought were two tactically brilliant and effectively executed legs of football against a, a technically and talent talent-wise superior opposition. Um, Clive, Porto have made this as hard as I've seen anybody really make it for us this season. We've played Liverpool three times. I don't think any of the three games were as hard as either of the games we got against Porto. Okay? I, and, and that's not to say Porto were better than Liverpool. That's not my point. Okay? Don't aggregate that. What I'm saying is they found ways to to analyze what we do and cut it out. They found ways to marginalize Bukayo Saka's impact. They found ways to unsettle Saliba. I think, for example, William Saliba, I think, is one of the best center backs in the world. If you want to say, where's his, where's his weakness? I don't think he's great at long balls in the air. I don't think he always reads them well. I don't think he heads them away well all the time. That's a part he's going to develop into. But if you give him a running race, if you give him a physical battle, if you try to dribble him, he can handle that. But when it's a long straight ball in the air... And he has to judge the flight and he has to head it away. That's not always his best. So they they went for that. And they had some success doing that, right? I think they found ways. They 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 found someone in Wendell who could do a number on um on Saka a little bit. And they found ways to get around Jorginho so he couldn't distribute. They did some really interesting things, Clive. And I there is a tendency when you're not at your best to say it's your fault, our fault for not playing better. But aside from hating. Porto's time-wasting tactics and dark arts tactics, I think there was some really excellent tactical work and performances done by them and at least worth tipping their hat to them for what they did, I think, you know? Yeah, they did a, <clears throat> quite a similar thing to what Brentford tried to do. They they mm. went long. You know, we were debating pre-game, weren't we, about Zinchenko or Kivio? Well, I'm glad we had Kivio on the pitch. How I'm good is he? We, uh, oh, mate, I, I, I like him. You know, um, mm. I think... We needed that ability to contest the first ball. So, Eddie, what are you trying to do? A bit of technical stuff here. And this is why it's not just on Saliba. When the ball goes long and you, you're you doing your back pedaling, you're back pedaling, and you know you've got to head it because they're dropping it on your head, right? And so what you have to do, you can't get distance because you head it down to somebody, the midfielder who who receives it, you need to give your, you need to give your own midfielders time to get under it. So what you do is you head it up. You head it up as high as you can. And so Jorginho and Rice can get back in and Martin Odegaard and try to contest that second ball. And they their their exit entry passes, sorry, into our back line were really strong. And we were having mm. to stretch and, and we couldn't get good contact all the time. They're picking up second balls. Mate, we're one nil down in European time. Everything matters. So we then extrapolate that and say uh, Sleeper's unsettled. Sleeper was stretched. He was he was stretched out slightly, and and that, that's all that happened. But I'm all right with it because I look at him. I think he, he's doing the right thing. He's trying to head it up. He's trying to head, and, and Gabriel doing the same thing. There wasn't the time. There wasn't the there wasn't the time to chest it down and then build play. There wasn't the time to do that. Right. So we had to we had to focus on just winning that first ball and contesting the second ball. Mate, it is the one thing that bothers me. But I've actually, I'm more bothered when it, the ball's bouncing. 
and, and we're yeah. having to make a decision. I, I like the fact we're taking it in the air and it comes back to my thing. I'm going to say it. I, I like in these big games, I want to see a, a double six system, you know, because mm. then you take care of that. You know, I felt Rice was a little bit high too early, too long, and we needed his hoover ability a little bit deeper. And I felt much more comfortable once he did that. Yeah, that's well well said. I I think there's definitely something for Mikel to look at there. And I'll tell you something too. I think they did a nice job negating our pressing, pressing structure. And this is where you being at the ground is a huge advantage because I never got the view of it. But they were doing something because Saka was actually having to go drop deeper in the first in their first phase of buildup. So when they were able to rotate back around to Wendell, Saka wasn't able to be up there to press him as quickly as he was. They they got an extra man forward to force Saka backwards. So our press was not as effective. Kai and Odegaard were closing down, but when it made it out to their left, our right, Saka couldn't be right on top of him. There were times we were able to when it got compressed, but they stretched the pitch. They had courage to stretch the pitch, I think, to keep our press from being really compact and suffocating. Um, I do think it's worth noting, by the way, these two legs are two of the worst games we've played this calendar year. And they're the only times we've had to play on three days rest this calendar year. And I'll tell you something. If you think back to some of our worst performances this season, it's the two portal legs. What are the other ones? Fulham and West Ham at the end of the, the Christmas program, the holiday program. I do wonder about this team playing on short rest and we're going to play on short rest basically the entire month of April. Yeah. So now we're getting back to quote unquote full fitness. I think Mikel has a big job to integrate players and trust them because some of these guys probably look a lot sharper and a lot better if they hadn't played an emotional game that went right to the death against Brentford at the weekend. Um, We are going to need to be fresh to play our football. And the only guy who looked fresh is Odegaard because I don't think he has lungs. I think he just has machines inside his body or whatever he has. But Clive, that, that's that's a component of this to me too, I think, is you talk about the fatigue at the end of the 120 minutes. Fair play to them for being able to even kick the ball in the net at the penalty shootout. But I do think that Mikel waited a long time on subs. He has players he clearly trusts. He went unchanged for this game. And I don't think he's going to be able to do that in April when it's going to be incredibly hectic for this team. Yeah, so let's pick that apart a little bit, right? Because I totally agree with you. Albino sent out a tweet today showing our fixtures for April and May, right up until May 19th. Mate, it's every three days. You know, three to four max. And and so your previous thought processes around what the first 11, we're going to have to just throw them away. Because it's just, if we do qualify for the semi-final Champions League, we are talking about a lot of football. And so the most important players in this squad are the ones who are not playing at the moment and what they do when they impact, when they get a chance to impact. And I've got to be honest with you, I don't think this is a Mikel theme because I wouldn't... There are, some, there are some players, people say, oh, you've got to trust more players. Mate, there are some players I don't trust. There are some players I don't trust who are not at the level physically to manage that level of game. Right? So, mm. And it's quite interesting to watch two players who that changed our belief structure in Zinchenko and Jesus, who are obviously not fit at the moment. And you, you're you literally watching, you could be watching the passing of the torch, you know, because there are other players who are more attuned, who are fitter, that are, that are literally taking over. They're taking over. They don't have to respond by getting fit on this international break. Yeah, Thomas Pye to that, Tom Yassi to that. We need these four players. Timber, I don't want to put any weight on that because... He's been out a long time. But let's be honest, Thomas Pye has been out since October. He's only played about four games. So he's basically lost his whole season. Tom Yasser, how many games has he played? Four hours. You know, he had one mm. patch. We're talking about players that just haven't had the contribution. And Elliot, mate, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Gabriel Jesus, none of this is going to happen without him. I don't care what... I thought he looked great care. when he came on. Yeah, he, he he almost, looked... He's really unlucky. He put that ball under... Costa's legs and just about got like a, a calf to it to direct it out. He, he looked great in that moment, but mate, I watched it. I watched the game and I think he might have been the fifth penalty taker. And I was thinking, Kwaki, I hope it goes well for you. But I watched this game. <laughs> yeah, it's not not his strong suit. <laughs> it might have been Ben White. Some people are saying Ben White was lined up was for it? the fifth penalty okay, taker. Interesting. Ben White. Yeah. I was just guessing that I, I couldn't see. Yeah. And, um, mate, he's not the Jesus that was ripping people, twisting their knees out last year. 
Mm. It's, it's not him. This isn't him. He's got a way to go. And, and mm. we need him. We need him, Sharp. We need Martinelli back. We need this because yeah. we need to share games. So we have the offensive power and zip and penetration. We run this group out, right out to the point where Saka looked dull and Odegaard went somewhere to find something. Havertz happens to be a man from Rome, so he found something. And Trussard managed to find enough to score the goal, but he wasn't ball dominant neither. We've run this lot out and we have to get more people into fitness shape to allow us to keep everybody fresh. Yeah, I will say on the Jesus thing, um, I thought he looked good when he was playing center forward. When Eddie came on and he moved out to the left, that's when I Fair thought point. he looked a lot less impactful. So yes. just, just a little yeah, w- way that I saw it. I, and it is interesting. You mentioned Martinelli. You know, we keep saying Trissard's such a good player. When he plays false nine, he looks great. Not as great left wing. Jesus looked great at nine. Didn't look great left wing. You know, for all for all the criticism Martinelli's come in for this season, for not doing as much on the end product front as he has, maybe there's something to him actually being really, really good because I thought we lacked the pace injection. I thought we lacked the direct running. I thought when we looked exposed a little bit, it's because, you know, Trissard can't get back and do the recovery runs the way Martinelli does. He cannot press with the intensity Martinelli does. So one to keep an eye on, but I think maybe Martinelli is showing that he's one of those players that we don't have a clean like-for-like replacement for. And it's like, look, I'm glad it's not Mikhailo Mudrik. Very glad. But... You can see why that was the profile because I think Mikel wants that player to be a, a very pacey, direct running kind of wide player. And Martinelli's more than just that, of course. But I think that's a characteristic that we lacked, you know? Yeah. And we just have to accept that, you know, Trussard is a very good 12th man and he's done a lot for us in the year that he's come. You think that last scored the January, goal that saved our lives. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, who last January bought. You know, Trussard, Kivior, and Jorginho, and basically all three of them started this game, and all three of them contributed in a way that we wouldn't have got through the tie without them. And so, mm. you know, they may not all be in all our ideal first 11s, but they're right there and they're fit and they're sharp. They're sharper than some of the injured ones that were, were the totems of last season. And we've got to get those guys back, as I said. Uh, Trussard's an interesting one. Sometimes he does a false nine thing and you can't see him. And then another day he does the same thing and he has he has 80 touches and, and three assists and <laughs> two goals. Yeah. And uh, But Martinelli, another player that got better when he didn't play, mate, didn't he? I thought. And I, I am not one, don't listen to the people talking about him. I think he rolling, he was rolling into top form since his two mm-hmm. goals at Palace. He's been excellent in this run, in this big scoring run. So yeah, we need him back. And I'm glad he's going to have two weeks to get himself into shape because he is going to be key for us. Won't be going away with Brazil, so he can get rested and ready, and hopefully then even get a little bit of training in at the Soba Realty Training Center um, before Manchester City. I think we did mention Troussard. The goal is brilliantly created, and and it's one time where Jorginho plays it long. The long balls weren't really working. It's a little hopeful, but we do get a bit of luck. It comes to Odegaard. What Odegaard does there is wizardry. But I... I, I see so much of the praise for that goal going to Odegaard. And I want to be a little bit careful to make sure Trissard gets his flowers because there were a lot of openings. It's weird, right? We think like we played terribly in some respects. There were a lot of openings. Saka got to the byline a couple of times, scuffed some cutbacks, right? We had some some moments where we got to the byline. I think we over-elaborated a few times, an extra little one-two. There was one with Odegaard and, and Kedia where they one-touched it instead of anybody taking the shot. That Troussard shot is probably the one clean shot we get in the box. Mm. And you have to take it. Yeah, it. I mean, you could miss that. I, that's not a That's not a big chance even. I don't think it goes down. It, may, it goes down as a big chance, I think, actually. But it's it's a tight angle. The finish is so clean. And, and Clive, for a player who I don't think was having his best game and hasn't always looked best off the left, he makes a nice run. Odegaard finds him brilliantly. But I, I just... I want to thank Leo Trossard for his composure and his finishing. In the box, Trossard has been one of our killers this season. He's been excellent. Yeah, he's a he's a he's an interesting player, really, isn't he? These multi-positional players that can do lots of things, they sort of affect us because we not because we when we say oh he's not sure if he's good on the left or he's good at false nine sometimes, they affect us. But in the end, he plays like one of us. He plays with our brain. And he sometimes he comes out of the crowd scene and rolls around from left to right 
and it opens the play out and the players know him and know what he's going to do. Around the box, he gets calmer, closer to goal, which is a, which is a good trait to have. And the goal sort of, I was at the other end, so the goal sort of surprised me a little bit. Was mm. it a surprise to you watching on TV? It's sort of, it's sort of the way it's created. Didn't feel like it was coming. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of like, the way it's created, it's sort of like dancing feet and he's just a little pass. I've seen that before. I didn't realise that so many people were frozen by it. I've seen that before. Just hard comes in and just slots it. Nice pass into the corner. Mm. That's qu- that's quality. That's composure, really. That's composure under the pressure, mate. I'd be kicking a case off that ball, and it'd be hitting the peanut seller in the in the in the, or in the ground. Y- you lay it back to the penalty spot and try to let it be someone else's responsibility, right? Yeah, you he just, you just give it to pace. someone else. Try to give it to someone else. Yeah, he yeah. uses his pace of his run to get the pace on the ball. You know, without him to kick it too hard. Mm-hmm. And I think, man, that's top class. Sign netting job. See you later. And I think it changed the context of the day. Obviously, we could we could relax a bit. And so people who are thinking we're going to win 5 0 are thinking, there we go, first one's in. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, given what's happened against Liverpool and against Brentford, let's get to half time by doing anything stupid just for half time. Mm. That's what I'm thinking. I um, stayed in my seat this time, so nothing happened. So that's that jinx sorted out. So, <laughs> like, um, and I'm thinking, okay, just, just get to half time. And they were making it bitty, there were stoppages. They were sitting down, and I'm thinking there was a little injury. I'm thinking, concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. Do not let them in. So it changes half time, and um, we managed to do that. And the second half was was what it was. Speaking of which, weird refereeing performance. So let's just talk about the disallowed goal for a second. Here's what I would say on this. I think it is a classic of this genre. I don't think what Kai does is what causes. That goal, I don't think yeah. it causes anything to happen to Pepe. I don't think it affects the play at all. If it's not given as a foul, I think the goal stands on review. I think it is a classic of the genre that if he gives the foul, VAR can't overturn it. If he doesn't give the foul, VAR won't overturn it. So to me, that's just a case of whatever the call on the pitch is, it stands. And look, this was a referee who was calling everything and then not everything, it was very hard to understand. There was one where Saka went in the air and he was bowled over and then went back and made a challenge and it, the foul was given on him. He gave yeah. fouls in weird ways. I don't know how Kai went through the game as long as he did without getting a yellow. He could have gotten yellows earlier. Their their players weren't getting yellows for some, I thought, some pretty nasty fouls. Like It just, the occasion felt very big to me and at times it looked too big for Arsenal at times. But it definitely looked too big for this this referee as well. I just I I don't think he had a clear idea of how he wanted to manage this game. Yeah, cause also we went to the away leg as well, wasn't it? And the contrast in not just the style of game in this competition, but almost like I said it before, it, it's almost feels like a different sport. I can't read mm-hmm. it. I can't read it. I thought we had the ref early on, then we lost him, and then he went into boxer rebels mode. I don't know what's going to come out of his whistle. I just didn't know what he's going to do, and that makes that makes you edgy. And this is a competition. When you, if he goes wrong, you're out. You know, it's like he didn't. He, he stressed me out massively. You know, I, I just didn't know what he's going to do. I've seen millions of games. You can sort of tell how a referee is, how it's going to happen, what he's leaning towards, who he's behind. If someone's giving him a shout and upset him, he might give the other team the next two fouls. You can read referees; they do stuff to control a game. I don't know what he was doing. I just couldn't tell. And um, did it influence the night for me? I I always felt that Saka could have got a bit more protection earlier. That's the one thing that worried me. That's the only thing I could say because with Martinelli not being there, mate, they keyed on Saka quite a lot because they knew we couldn't penetrate on both sides. And I think that's the only bit I would say, a little bit more protection there. Did you notice something, by the way, on the corners? On the corner kicks? We didn't put Ben White on the keeper. Because I think we saw from the first leg, yeah. th- they're just going to call it every single time. If you remember the first leg, you were getting frustrated. Like, why don't we go short? Because they we kept going long, they'd co- keep going down the box, and everything was a foul. I thought we took our corners differently than our usual routines because we understood, like, if you're combative at all, they're just going to go to ground and get the whistle. So yeah. I thought that was interesting. Maybe the funniest thing, it's so funny, everybody uniformly <laughs> cried out at once. The funniest thing in the whole game might have been when the board went up for one minute of stoppage time oh, at the end of the first half and they didn't even play it. I mean, there were three minutes wasted 
going into stoppage time. Then the board goes up for one minute. Then they don't even play the whole minute. Ball was, I mean, Clive, the stoppage time thing in the Champions League, like, it's just not a thing. I don't know. Maybe they have a contractual obligation for the halftime sponsors to get their advertisements by a certain time on the clock. But like, yeah, yeah that, that I, was pretty I, funny. I, I, thought. Don't know what, I don't know what I'm doing. What we're watching, you know, and um, I don't I don't know what to say earlier. I don't know what we're watching. When that come up, I just laughed, which means yeah, we all did. Yeah. You're you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to be like that. You know, I didn't. I haven't enjoyed these Porter games. I have. I don't like mm -hmm. them as a club. I'm going to say, man, I don't often say these words. I'm not sure that's good analysis, but I don't like them as a club. I don't like how they how they act on the pitch. I don't like their motivations, their prime motivations, and how they approach football. I know it's all part of the game. No one can be pretty and beautiful, etc. But I don't like how they operate. And when the Concert South thing came out earlier, and I just wrote a two word a two word tweet. F him. Well, you know I don't swear very much. I think of all I think the tweets. I think you got like 10,000 likes or something. It might be your most yeah. popular ever tweet. I, I, it's all those analysis <laughs> tweets with the, with the spaces and the bullet points and stuff I'm trying to be intelligent <laughs> about. Uh, don't worry about that. Just say F him, Clive, and we'll, we'll like that one. Do you know what I mean? That literally how it felt. <laughs> I, I woke up this morning and thought, bloody hell, what's happened here? Right? So, um, <laughs> so yeah, it's but I, because people felt it. Get sod them. Move them on. You're out. Do one. You're mm -hmm. out, mate. Get on the plane. You know, honestly, they. I got. I don't look back at them at all. I ain't watching this game again. I don't look back at them at all. They. They are, do not epitomize what I hope and think football is. I know styles mm -hmm. make fights, etc., but that can't be encouraged. And you encourage it by giving them referees that allow them to do what they want to do, and then reducing the time on the where we actually see some football. We forgot to have a good yep. look at what they're doing here, mate. This isn't. This is not going to work. And before anybody says, you know, oh, what do you expect from them? They're playing a better team or anything like that. Just to be clear, that is who they are in their league as well. Um, mm. The ball in play time they had against us is similar to the ball in play time they have in their domestic league. So, you know that that's just who they are. That's their identity. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I I, I just think. We know that European football is refereed a little differently. I think as we get later in the competition, there'll be better referees. But I just don't think maybe Atleti, like if at, if Athletic if Atletico Madrid get through, I think they have a tough job on their hands today um, against Inter, and they're trailing, so they may not get through. I don't think there's another team that will approach a tie the way Porto did remaining. Um, PSV and Dortmund have a tight tie to settle today, and. Atleti and Inter have one to settle today, and I don't think any of the other teams are going to play in anything like that way. Um, People can approach the games as they as they want to, Elliot. But it's how the referee mm -hmm. manages the situation, uh, and that's the key. I I, I got to be honest. I saw the videos of Concesao after the first leg, smoking a cigar in the yeah. dressing room, and their celebrations, and they did a lap of honor, and good for them. It's a big win. I get it. Um, I think Concesao was going to come in for a lot of credit, actually, despite their their diving and their dark arts and all that. I think him, his team was going to come in for a lot of credit for the, how they tactically yep. deployed their talent in this tie until he lost his ragged full time and decided to turn this into a, a telenovela. And I think he claims that Mikel insulted his family. If you want to look this up, he made the same claim about Tuchel against Chelsea. He made a similar claim about Pep at City. I mean, this guy is just a bad loser. That's what he has a reputation for. Um, I absolutely love Kai bodying him on the touchline now yep. that I know what kind of guy this is. <clears throat> but instead of coming away from this, Clive saying, they're a little dirty and they're a little dark artsy, but I got a lot of time for what Constance Al pulled out here. <clears throat> I think he makes himself look classless. Really, really classless. And it's yeah. it's a shame. Leave that on the pitch. You know, leave that on the pitch. You're going to get plaudits for what you did in the tie. And instead, he's got to turn it into that. And he has a lot of... A lot of previous for it. So any any thoughts on him and his nonsense? Well, F him, basically. That literally, mm. that's it. I don't want to waste any time on him. When we lost to Sporting Lisbon last year, and we were trying to get mm. Champions League, and we were, you know, we lost two players, which is a bigger issue for us, right? We were top of the league, and we were pushing on. They had a coach there called Ruben Amarim, and mm -hmm. I thought he was excellent. 
not just in the way he set his team up. We know some of those players now, they're very talented. But the way he operates, the way he acts, Conte Sal is an equally as good coach. I don't like his style of football. But if you're a chairman today, you ain't taking him on. You ain't taking him on. It's not because of the way he coaches his team, because of the way he acts. He'll torture your club, mate. He'll torture your club's reputation. I'm, I'm, I've only got a two-game experience of him, right? So I'm not going to talk like I know his whole life. But I think he's let himself down. He's let himself down. And this happens a lot with, with Arsenal. You know, sometimes with managers, and Thomas Frank did at the weekend. He sort of took the, he took the, the game and made it about Havertz should have been sent off. And people do this to us quite a lot. And I think mm. we don't quite get to talk about us. We get to talk about the fallout. And the fallout is about whatever the opposite manager wants to say. Or, you know, we yeah. play West Ham, we beat them six. David Moyes is going through a tough time at this period of time. Well, he seems to recover pretty well since then. We play Sheffield United, beat them. Oh, they're not good enough. But then they've got a point of the weekend at Bournemouth. It just whatever it is, we seem to not get what we deserve. But maybe we just need to, well, I need to stop worrying about that and just focus on what we're actually doing. And what we're doing right now is we're sitting there top of the league, score the most goals, concede the least goals, and in Champions League quarter final for the first time in 14 years. Mate, we should be smoking the cigars today, not not contest out. Yeah, and, and and I think you just said something really important too. If we got through this tie this way, and in the league we were playing crap, and we played kind of crap in this tie, and our football didn't look very good, and we were sitting fifth in the league, I might say there's something a little broken, but that's not the case. Mm. We have the best goal difference by a mile in the league, the best XG difference by a mile in the league. We are top of the league on a phenomenal point total, and we're into the quarterfinals. So you know what? Yeah, if maybe we're slightly below our level in a competition that we don't have a lot of experience in, up against a team playing in a very specific way that that I think thwarts our flow, like, okay, okay, because I have enough evidence, overwhelming evidence, that we're actually very, very, very good. So the job here was to get through and it's job done, and that's all I see from it. And I think, look, as important as it is for the club that we got through, I think it is equally important that we did not crash out. I Every one of those players probably felt that weight on their shoulders. 14 years, the weight of 14 years, everybody's heard it. They know it. They know we haven't gotten through. They know they crashed out on penalties, you know, in the Europa League to Sporting, to Villarreal, to Olympiacos. You know, it hasn't been good for Mikel in knockout competitions in Europe since he's arrived. This was important for everyone. And now I think just some of the, the pressure can lift. Because I think we got a little bit of something off our back there. I, I yeah. think there were a few things that surprised me. Um, a little surprised not to see Thomas Party come on, and I wonder if that's a fitness issue or a trust issue or where he'll be. Because I, I suspect that having a healthy Thomas Party for the run-in could be quite valuable um, if there's a way to reintegrate him. But that may not happen. We'll see. I think. I think he would have come um, on earlier if we if we'd have scored in in play. Mm. He would have come on to close the game down. So somebody else will maybe Odegaard would have come off, and we'd have said, "Right, we're going to close. We're going to shut this game down." You know, but um, but I didn't think it was the right thing to do in, in this game. So yeah, that's fine. The Zinchenko performance. I know a lot of people were really frustrated with it. He did have some giveaways that were hurtful. I think the interesting thing is he also had um he had a ridiculous pass from like deep midfield in Eddie and Kedia between the lines between yeah. the defenders, and Eddie, Eddie slipped. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, he slipped and he fell over the ball. And like in that sub performance from Zinchenko, I think you see every reason why he's valuable to us. Cause for the first time in the game, we started to see balls break lines and get to forward players, you know, not by being carried to them or handed to them, but between lines and in spaces. But we also saw giveaways that were hurtful. And obviously with the game that pressurized and the tie on the line, the giveaways feel more painful than the, than the, uh, progressive passes, which is why I think Zinchenko is a guy for the start of games and not a guy for the finish of games. His risk reward meter suits the the beginning of games more than I think it suits the end of games. Is that a fair way to put it? Yeah, we're gonna need we we're gonna need to control some games. <coughs> Sorry, mm. against some opponents and just take the ball away from them and go to a steady back three behind him and just use him to just keep the ball away from them and just control the game, play where we want it to be. And on those days, we need efficient line-breaking passing so we can win a game in 55 minutes, not have to do it against Brentford. We're all going to be clapping him. We're all going to be clapping him. Mm. Right? So um, yeah. 
So yeah, I think um, that's going to be important. I look at this moment in time. I watched him play last night, and I saw like I saw last year vibes that I didn't like. But I'm also forgetting how good he can be. And the most important thing: let's get these guys back to health. You know, so we can see them because n- not every game is going to be like this. You know, but I do agree with your premise. First hour, control everything, kill the game, get him off the pitch. On some days, on other days, particularly at home, other days away, let's set up, cradle the team, strong defenders, and make sure we can we can physically manage people when they're dropping on our back line, and then we play from there. So we got the options now, mate. We just got to pick them on the right day. Yeah, huge night for the club. A huge night for the club coming in what, 19 days time, 18 days time when we go to the Etihad. Um, But before then, there is a draw on Friday. We will cover that over on Patreon, but we can discuss it briefly now. I'm just happy to be in it. But what are your thoughts as you look? I mean, I, I read out those teams, PSG, Bayern, Barca, Madrid, City, Arsenal, probably Inter, and one of Dortmund, PSV. I mean, if PSV get through, you could say, oh, we want that. But how did it go when we, got, you know, when we got a small, a smaller in quotes club in this round, do you have a preference? Do you have a thought of who you want to avoid? I would, I would put it this way. Having gone through that misery, I'm fine with anyone we get except City. I don't want City in the next round, especially with what we're going through with them in the league around the same time. So what, what are your thoughts on the draw and, and who's left? Yeah, I don't need City just because the emotional damage it will do to us for our league if our league games, two games against them will just clean you out completely. And um, but I don't mind anybody else to be honest. Um, I watched Madrid play Leipzig in the last round. Okay, Madrid might have been taking a couple of punches if they conceded and might have scored. Well, they did not look great. They did not look mm. balanced. Um, they got a bunch of injuries too. To be fair, they got injuries. They got defender. They got Militao coming back, but he's had a crucial similar time as Timber, so that's going to take a bit of time to get back in. Courtois, Courtois coming back quite quickly, but again, been out for since the first games of the season. So, yeah, they can be got at, right? So it's not Madrid of old. So can Bayern Munich. Or, in fact, the, these Portuguese teams are the ones <laughs> that scare me the most because mm. of how they play. And then they do have talent within their within their lineup, real burgeoning talent that use that league to get to the next league. And we ran into a couple. We ran into a few at Sporting last year. And we ran into a few against Porto as well. And, and some of those names are on our YouTube links and they're out there or on mine anyway. You know what I'm like. And so, um, and yeah, the, I'll be looking at those two teams going forward, you know, because they've got some really smart players. But as for what's left in the draw, I'm just, I'm glad we're there. I'm glad we're at this table because I think we belong here. And I think we can go one more quite quickly. I'm just looking at the fixtures and I'm just worried. I'm worried. It's not the tie. It's the tie. You leave and the then... worrying to me. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's not the tie. It's the it's the Brighton and Villa around the quarterfinal. You know that's you know they're not they're not rubbish teams, right? So you got you got three games in a row there that you have to manage. You know, and um, so yeah, hopefully we catch Brighton and Villa on there on the downslide. But you know they they both had success against us in recent years, right? So. That's the challenge for us, mate, managing both competitions. Yeah, I mean, not only do we go to Brighton and go to Spurs and host Villa and go to City and go to Old Trafford, we're going to be, and we still have Chelsea at home, we're going to be doing it every three days. Yeah. And, I mean, we are very, very fortunate, at least right now as we sit here recording this, with what our fitness looks like. Mikel is going to have to trust them. He is going to have to trust them. He's he's not going to be able to pick the same 11 every game. Or I think we will see a drop-off in the level. But when you have the luxury of picking a Jesus and picking a Thomas Party and, you know, picking a Tamiyasu, right? I, I think it's big. I really yeah. do think it's big. And maybe he will have to trust a Fabio Vieira or trust an Emil Smith Rowe. Good shout, I mean, Fabio Vieira. You know, you know the, we're going to need that's a very good shout. I, I think, I thought, I looked at the, I analyzed the first game actually, and I thought if he was fit, he'd be perfect to sort of play in that eight position in that first game. We could have played could play Kai higher, you know, and um, there's there's something in that kid. We just need to see if it's there. Have we, have we got time? Have we got time, you know, to see? But yeah, there's a there's something in him, and he brings that last pass into the box and last shot. 
the sort of stuff you need when you're one one, you know, away at Wolves. We're gonna do. And so we we're gonna turn to him and I think it's gonna be really important. Yeah, and for me in terms of the draw, like I, I'd love to get a club where it feels like an occasion, but I'm not sure I want the biggest clubs just yet, not in the quarterfinal. Like I don't know if I don't know if you want the biggest club in the quarterfinal. Bayern Munich look really vulnerable to me. Really vulnerable. But I I am just sick to the teeth of Harry Kane. And I just don't Mate, know. Don't worry about Harry Kane. They've got Delit and Dyer as their centre backs. They look like a couple of <laughs> twins there, right? And um, yeah. mobilities, when you look at them two, mobility is not the watchword that comes out, right? So um No. So they're strong. We owe them. Don't if you can't you know my view. You sent our backs for everything. They're everything. If they, you got them too, we got a chance, no matter what they do. If if you want if you want to talk payback, the two clubs you want to draw next round, if you want to right some wrongs, either Barca or Bayern. And you're not going to find a better time probably to get either of them in terms of their vulnerability. So yeah. I would say that Barca and Bayern would be great draws in terms of not that we'd be favorites or we'd definitely win, but that we can win and we can right some wrongs. And then you're looking at the cities and the Madrids, probably at the very tail end of this whole thing. Um, you know, maybe if Dortmund get through, that could be a fun one. I will say this. I don't know that there's a more intimidating atmosphere than Dortmund for an away game. Mm. You know, they are, that is a tough, tough place to play, but I don't know that they're super good. So we'll see. Um, there's so much time now. We're By the way, w during the um, international break, we're going to do a lot of scouting videos. So Gyorkresh, Ferguson, Sesco, Nico Williams will be on all of that. Um, we're going to obviously talk to some some specialists. We'll do some tactical breakdowns of what's coming up with City. Um, we've got a lot of fun stuff planned. Phil Costa has a brand new podcast coming out. We're going to be sharing that with you because he's <clears throat> going to do some general football stuff. And I think episode one is going to be a really exciting one from what I hear. Um, so there's there's that coming up. Just as a final word on this, Clive, and we'll get out of here. Last thoughts on how you're feeling today about the club, about the, the players, about the manager, about where we are. I just... I feel so joyous and to have these 19 days to soak up being top of the table and into the Champions League quarterfinals. Football doesn't give you this much. So we should just extract all the joy out of it that we can. Yeah. I, I, the words that come into my mind is we've gone through an experience together, right? And yeah, I've seen us win Champions League games before, but it didn't feel like this. This feels brand new because it's with new people, right? New you know, the way we look at football now, the way we all interact with football and connect with each other globally, the, we do things like this. The whole feeling around the club has completely changed. The whole thing around football, how, it, how its managers change and how it's consumed has changed. And so our ability to analyse teams, have data on teams, opposition teams, our own team, has really opened up a window to us. And I look at this and I think this group of people needed this experience we all want the big stuff, right? We all want it secretly. We think we might win the league, we might win the Champions League, but we ain't going to win it unless we go through experiences like this. You know, Man City blew a Champions League final, overthought it and picked the wrong team and blew it. You know, mm -hmm. right to the final and blew it. They got everything going for them. We need to suffer this sometimes. We really do. I know we didn't need to suffer to a point where we went out against Porto. Though. I'm not. I'm not advocating that. I was not advocating we needed space to win the league by going out of the European Cup in the last 16. That was not in my head. I've said that before, the Europa League, but not for this competition. I think we yeah, and we needed this, mate. We need sorry, my watch went off there. <laughs> we, <laughs> we uh we needed to go through this and we needed to get this on our CV. The most important night for many a year. And from it, I think we're gonna feel different. Like David Raya feels and how he's felt since Dubai. He feels and looks different. We're finding people like Kivio and Havertz. We're finding them just like they were they were disappeared at the start of the year. They were barely there. We were looking and squinting and seeing what's there. Now we want them on that pitch, don't we? So the more people we can find like this, I think is really key for going forward. Yeah, and look, Manchester United are a giant club a giant club they're not very good right now but they're a giant mm. club they have pedigree in this competition they finished dead last in a group with galatasaray copenhagen and a weak Bayern. okay newcastle finished dead last in a harder group but dortmund milan psg only one of them is left in the competition so 
the Premier League makes it hard to thrive in this competition. Definitely. Clubs, big clubs can struggle in this competition. You know, Leipzig got a result against Real Madrid. This competition at this stage just stops being easy, period. And when push comes to shove, we're still in it. That's what matters. That's what we can celebrate. We are at a table that we haven't sat at in 14 years, and it feels really good, and we should yeah. be really proud of our young boys because that is one of the youngest squads left in the in the Champions League. And they are doing things, and this young manager is doing things that you don't usually do at this stage of your career. So kudos to them. Kudos to our captain, Martin Odegaard, who epitomizes that word, to our keeper, David Raya, who has not just made the position him his, but pulled the club close to himself and pulled the fans close to himself with his performance last night. Yeah. A big, big night for the club and something we will be talking about more as the weeks go on. So I think we can leave it there. Glad to get this out a day early because how could we wait? Um, if you want the raw emotion, like I said, the instant reaction in its video, I think is is one to check out. It is extremely exuberant. So uh, enjoy. Clive's on Twitter. Clive, thanks, man. Thank you very much. Tim and Paul will obviously be on in a future episode, as will other people, I have no doubt. My name is Elliot Smith. <clears throat> you can and must block me, Yankee Gunner. We love you. And even though it's 19 days from now, or 18 days as we sit here, we will talk to you after Arsenal 10, Manchester City 0. No.